So welcome, welcome. My name is Candice Noonan. I have a little disclosure. I am the Director of Education for Environ Skincare. Um, I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm a licensed esthetician. I also have my certification in oncology aesthetics. I am born and raised South African, although um, I didn't come over here working for Environ, which is ironically a South African product. Um, I happen to end up working for them. I'm so grateful that I have because it's certainly given me the opportunity to study something I'm very, very passionate about, and that's the health of the skin, and in particular, uh, melanogenesis and pigmentation. I had a very personal experience during my third trimester of pregnancy of developing severe, severe melasma, and uh, so this has really been a focus of my studies, so I hope you enjoy this presentation. So to start, the evolution of skin is covered by a TED talk by Nina Jablonski, and I really connected with this particular talk because of how she speaks of how the skin evolved to be where we are today and how we are today, and how she starts with uh, the theory of evolution from Darwin and how when he was traveling the world, the one thing he never took into consideration was the change in the color of skins of these peoples and these countries that he was visiting. And she says if, you had pay, if he had paid attention to it, he would have noticed how that on the equator and equatorial regions, skins had evolved to be very, very dark, and this dark pigment had protected us from the UV. And as we moved away from these equatorial regions and into areas where there is very low UV, this developed a different type and a different kind of um, issue for our skins because then this dark skin wasn't able to metabolize and produce vitamin D. And without vitamin D, we become inherently unhealthy, we become very sad, seasonal depression. Um, we can have associated cancers like prostate and breast cancer associated with uh, vitamin T D deficiency. But then, as we moved away from these equators and our skins did evolve to be much lighter in order to be healthier and to allow vitamin D metabolism, we then um, moved again and we started immigrating back to the equatorial regions, but then taking these fair skins and green eyes and red hairs back to these equatorial regions, then again gave us a whole bunch of issues like premature aging and uh, skin cancers. So with us moving around, it showed that the sun has a huge influence on the color of our skin and how our skin reacts to it. So basically what happens is when you're on these dark equatorial regions or these places close to the polar regions, your skin is a UV, um, your eyes are a UV meter and they register how much UV light you are being exposed to. And this UV registration then goes and, and it, it tackles the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland releases a protein, propriomelanocortin, and this is the precursor and the stimulant that releases melanin stimulating hormone or MSH. And basically this is the beginning start and the beginning process to the whole melanogenesis story. And this will become important later. So remember about MSH. And this MSH then will adhere to receptor sites on both the melanocyte and the keratinocyte. And as we know, the melanocyte is the major cell that produces pigmentation. It then produces melanosomes, which carry the pigment granule. They get transferred along these long dendrites, and they get dropped into the surrounding keratinocytes, 36 surrounding keratinocytes to be exact. So these melan then these melanosomes then transfer and deposit the melanin granule over the DNA of the keratinocyte to protect that DNA, because ultimately UV radiation, chronic and long-term, will damage the skin's DNA, thereby creating an abnormal skin cell cluster. So that's the primary purpose of melanin, is to absorb UV. And it's an incredible um, uh, little molecule that can absorb high rates of UV radiation. So when you look at the melanocyte itself, it's a dendritic cell. So it has very long arms, and because of that, it can supply up to 36 surrounding little keratinocytes around it. And the melanocyte itself creates melanin through tyrosinase. So tyrosinase is the enzyme, and it metabolizes tyrosine and creates the melanosome that carries the pigment. Then L-dopa and dopaquinone 
will create the actual melanin granule. Now, according to your DNA and your genetics, this will di dictate how many red little granules you have or how many brown little granules. And this is sort of the knitting pattern that your skin gets handed when you're born, according to your genetics. Then these little melanosomes will transfer through the dendrites and be dropped into the surrounding keratinocyte. Then that little keratinocyte goes on its own little process of travel, and it starts in the basement layer, it adjusts the melanin granules over the DNA, and then it goes through its process of, of um, metabolism. It moves from the basal layer, it moves up into the spiny layer, then it goes to the granular layer, and until eventually it sloughs off. So when you expose yourself to chronic UV or to regular UV over the summer, you spend a little bit more time at the beach, those receptor sites are stimulated by MSH. The melanocytes and keratinocytes talk to each other a lot. There's a lot of communication that happens between those two cells. And they talk a lot about how much UV is around. And then the melanocyte produces pigmentation. The more keratinocytes are produced to pick up these excess, keratinization, um, excess melanin granules. And then the melanin granules slowly migrate through that process with the keratinocytes until eventually sloughing off. When the UV is reduced, typically the MSH or melanin stimulating hormone is also reduced. So therefore, you lose your tan at the end of the summer. So now, how come then, at the end of the summer, when you have perfect cellular turnover that, you know, every 28 to 40 days when your skin cells slough off, why then am I not left with a wonderfully clean, perfectly even-toned skin? And this is where the melanogenesis process goes wrong. One of the big things that happens is that the melanocyte gets damaged by having his dendrites shorten. And when his dendrites are shortened, instead of supplying 36 surrounding keratinocytes with pigmentation, he dumps all that pigmentation that he's created in a very small area. So you get that pigment dumping. You also get DNA damage to the melanocyte because the melanocyte, through the process of melanogenesis, this is an excruciatingly difficult thing for the melanocyte to do. It produces a lot of free radicals. It, it creates a lot of energy output. And this in itself can damage the melanocyte. So if your melanocyte is put under pressure to produce more pigmentation than it should, you can end up causing the melanocyte's DNA damage. And at that point, the melanocyte goes cuckoo, and he just produces and he spews out pigmentation. So DNA regulation within the melanocyte becomes important so that you can control that uncontrolled pigmentation production. Then on the other side, you have the keratinocyte that he himself can get DNA damage. So without a great cellular membrane or without correct DNA structure, that keratinocyte forgets to switch off the communication between himself and the melanocyte and then keeps on spewing out this, this uh, signal for the melanocyte to produce pigmentation. If there's DNA damage to the keratinocyte, this could also mean that the melanocyte can inadvertently dump pigment into the surrounding keratinocytes, and when they reproduce, they reproduce automatically with more pigment in them. So you have that um, keratinocyte that cannot stop the process. He himself is producing with pigmentation. And then, as I mentioned, because the whole process increases the number of keratinocytes that are being created, these, can, these keratinocytes can then be saturated with pigmentation. They cannot absorb any more pigment granules that the melanocyte is producing, so those pigment granules end up falling through and getting trapped in the epidermal junction, in the dermal epidermal junction. Now, when we're young and frisky and 18 and tanning with um, reflective things and baby oil, you might not think it's important that those, those pigment granules are being trapped in your dermal epidermal junction. But from the age of 30, when oxidative stress um, is a big issue for your skin, those pigment granules can then change from a clear color to a darkened color. Because ironically enough, you won't see the change in pigment until the transfer happens out of the melanocyte into the keratinocyte. The pigmentation granules clear. And only through oxidative stress or when the pigment granule transfers into the keratinocyte do you see that color developing. So that's why from the age of 30 onwards, we start seeing these pigmentation marks developing that aren't inside any keratinocyte or inside the melanocyte. They're actually trapped in the dermal epidermal junction and extremely difficult to take care of and to get rid of. 
So when it comes to reading a cosmetic chemistry book, there is the A to Z of skincare ingredients and there's so many different options. So I'm hopefully going to take you through just a few different options as to what you can apply topically and improve the appearance of pigmentation. So we start with the vitamin A's. Vitamin A is an essential ingredient, not only to the health of the skin, but also when it comes to targeting a pigmentation protocol. Vitamin A comes in many different forms. Um, the retinoic acid is a very aggressive form. It can be very drying to the skin. It can cause irritation. And this is mainly used as part of your prescription forms of vitamin A. Sensitive skins have a hard time using it. And since it's photosensitizing for somebody with pigmentation, making them sensitive to the sun may not be the best process. So we focus a lot on the use of the ester forms of vitamin A, retinol palmitate and retinol acetate. These are very skin-friendly forms of vitamin A. So you can get DNA correction out of your vitamin A products, but not cause any sun sensitivity. And that's where the importance of vitamin A comes in, is it'll correct the DNA damage of your keratinocytes, it'll correct the DNA damage of that melanocyte, telling him to calm down and remember the knitting pattern that he was given. And to uh, one of the nice little side benefits, it's going to feed the fibroblast and create more collagen, so a healthier skin structure functions properly. Then we move on to the vitamin B group, in particular, vitamin B3. The rest of the vitamin Bs are beneficial to the skin, but with regards to melanogenesis, the vitamin B3 or niacinamide is the important ingredient. Vitamin B3 is one of the only ingredients that are going to stop the transfer of the melanosome from the melanocyte into the keratinocyte. So it stops the transfer and helps to even out the skin tone in that matter. As a little side benefit, it's also anti-inflammatory because this whole process is it causes inflammation. As I mentioned, creating pigmentation by your melanocyte is a very big deal for it to do. It, puts off a, it burns up a lot of energy and puts out a lot of free radicals. So the, the anti-inflammatory portion of that vitamin B3 is an important inclusion as well. Then we focus a lot on vitamin C. Vitamin C is a powerful and natural tyrosinase inhibitor. Lots of different companies will work with many formulations um, of vitamin C. There's not just one type of vitamin C. As allascorbic acid, you have to be aware of allascorbic acid because it's inherently unstable. After two weeks of manufacture, you'll have an ingredient that's 50% uh, less than its intended percentage. So you need to look for vitamin Cs that are a little bit more stable, giving you more efficacious results over a longer period of time. So then we look at more mus uh, magnesium ascorbyl phosphates or sodium ascorbyl phosphates. They've got a, a more stable shelf life. And ultimately, the oil-soluble vitamin Cs are going to give you the best results because we can actually get 10 times more active vitamin C into the skin cell itself when you give it the vitamin C that's oil soluble. And because it's encapsulated, it's going to have a much longer shelf life. So in terms of the process of melanogenesis, the vitamin C is going to really target that tyrosinase. And if you remember, tyrosinase is the enzyme that activates the tyrosine and actually builds the melanin granule. And that's where a lot of um, pigmentation ingredients are going to focus. And that will include hydroquinone, lactic acid, and kojic acid, which I'll go into in a little while. Vitamin E is an important skincare ingredient. Not only is it very moisturizing for the skin, it's also a key free radical scavenger. And why having a free radical scavenger as part of your skincare regimen is so important is because that melanocyte as part of its natural process of pigment formation will create a lot of free radicals. Our bodies itself creates a lot of free radicals during natural metabolism. So having a skincare line that includes vitamin E is going to ensure that that free radical doesn't then in turn damage the skin even further. So, but to really understand what a free radical is, a little bit more science behind it, when your body produces free radicals, it's a natural byproduct of energy production. It's much like the exhaust fumes out of a car when you burn gas. And these free radicals are unstable molecules that knock off electrons of surrounding molecules. So they create a chemical imbalance. And fortunately, things like antioxidants, such as vitamin E, will stabilize that effect by giving up their electrons without themselves becoming free radicals. 
But you don't just need one or two antioxidants. You need a plethora or a myriad, favorite words, a lot of different antioxidants because your skin's a lot of different layers of cells and water and oil. So we need a lot of different antioxidants working in each of those phases to really give you the best protection. Now, glutathione, as a matter of interest, is one of our body's own most potent uh, antioxidants that we produce. Unfortunately, applying it topically, it's a very large molecule, very difficult to get in the skin. And chances are we're going to be, we are smart enough to make it smaller or encapsulated that we will one day be able to topically apply it. But for the moment, we have to supply our skin with vitamins like A, C, and E. And when you do so, your body itself will create this powerful antioxidant. We get antioxidants from things like green tea and red tea, lycopene from tomatoes, and using a lot of different antioxidants is the best way to really protect your skin. Now you can have the best laid plan, best laid skin care, the best um, protocol is to treat pigmentation, but if you don't supply sunscreen to your clients, everything goes out the water. Every step forward you take, you're going to take 10 steps back. The best sun protection you can have is from a physical blocker. It sits on top of the skin, it doesn't penetrate into the skin, and the worst thing you have to worry about is it being rubbed off. And that's why we reapply our sunscreen every 90 minutes to 120 hours, depending on how long we are in the sun and what the sun exposure is. Zinc oxide is an excellent sunscreen. From a chemical point of view, a cosmetic chemistry point of view, it's very difficult to uh, stabilize in a formulation. So that's why you'll notice a lot of sunscreens that contain zinc contain only zinc. They might have zinc and titanium, but there's no other vitamins or ingredients incorporated because it's, it doesn't play well with others. If you put it on the playground with other vitamins, zinc oxide's the bully. But titanium dioxide isn't, may not be as great in terms of a sunscreen ingredient, but it does very well in blocking both UVA and UVB, and it's very stable within a formula. You can formulate this with other ingredients like vitamins and antioxidants that then boost the sunscreen's protection. The sunscreen chemicals are becoming more and more controversial the more and more they studied. And the problem with sunscreen chemicals when it comes to, with regards to melanogenesis, is that they penetrate into the skin. And once they're in the skin, they absorb the energy from the sun but they don't know what to do with this energy. And in an, under normal circumstances, they spin and they get, they get very excited with this, this UV energy. And then they transfer this energy as heat into the skin. Now with a normal skin, the pigmentation isn't an issue. We don't even need to think about that. But when it comes to melanogenesis in terms of melasma, it becomes very difficult when you have heat in the skin because that heat can then stimulate the melanocyte into producing more pigmentation. And you'll often find that somebody who has melasma in particular, even if they think the word sun, their melasma will flare because of that. In, the melasma is controlled a lot internally through hormones and not even as much through external stimuli like UV. Now, acids and enzymes are very popular to help treat pigmentation, but they're really more of a band-aid than they are a treatment, so to speak. Um, there are one or two that we'll go through that are particularly good, but really, in general, the acids are going to change the pH of the skin and have a chemical, exfoli a chemical exfoliation, so they remove the vertical orientation of the keratinocytes, so the mark appears lighter. But you haven't fixed any of the underlying issues that may be caused causing the pigmentation. So it's, it might be short-sighted to do just peels for pigmentation and not incorporate the corrective skin care. Another thing that it does is it has an actual chemical uh, reaction with the melanin granule. It lightens the melanin granule as it moves up through the layers of the skin coming into contact with this lower pH. The, the pigment granule itself gets lighter. So again, the, pigments, the pigment uh, lesion seems better, but you haven't addressed the issue. So that's why an, uh, an ingredient like lactic acid is particularly good for pigmentation because it's a tyrosinase inhibitor. It's not as strong as vitamin C or hydroquinone, but it certainly is a, a, a pigmentation corrector because of its tyrosinase activity. But it will also lighten the pigment through exfoliation and through the pH change within the skin.
Salicylic acid, we really concentrate more on. That's an oil-soluble acid, so that's great for um, acneic skin. Trichloroacetic acid is an excellent um, exfoliator and peel, but really resorcinol being a vitamin A derivative is far better at treating pigment than just simply putting that Band-Aid on. Then some of our other act actives, kojic acid, it's very popular um, in the Japanese culture because it's part of making up uh, sake. And the thing about kojic acid is, is that you have to use very high percentages in order to get a significant change in the pigmentation. And because of those high percentages, you can have some sensitivity um, showing up on the skin. Um, some studies has, of, has also shown that it uh, can deregulate the DNA of the skin cells. So it can be a little bit more of a controversial ingredient. Hydroquinone is very well known in the industry. It is one of the best ingredients that we have for bleaching pigmentation and lightening pigmentation. Um, hydroquinone has been banned over the counter in over the counter use in every civilized country since the 1990s, and it really should be very well regulated in in terms of how you use it. Uh, shorter treatment programs, three months at a most, is really how long you should be on hydroquinone because studies have also shown how it can cause damage to not only the melanocyte, and that's why when you stop hydroquinone after long term use, you may suffer from rebound pigmentation because that damaged melanocyte then is completely messed up in the head. He doesn't know what he's doing. He just starts producing pigmentation. Um, it is also known to be cytotoxic to the other cells of the skin as well, in, including the, the fibroblasts. So there's long-term damage that may happen with long-term and chronic use of hydroquinone. So the treatment program should be really well monitored and much shorter. Then there's ingredients like sepi white. Uh, MSH gives you a clue as to what it does. MSH is that melanin stimulating hormone, and Sepi White, the manufacturer is uh, Sepic, and uh, when you go onto their site, they show you the white papers of Sepi White and how it's as um, effective at lightening pigmentation as hydroquinone, but without any of the side effects. Um, so Sepi White helps to block the whole melanin stimulating hormone cascade, and then. This is how the whole process comes together. So you have your vitamin A for DNA control and DNA correction. You have your vitamin C along with your other options for tyrosinase inhibitors, um, ascorbyl tetraisopalmitate, hydroquinone, lactic acid, and kojic. And you have sepi white that stops the whole process because it blocks the melanin stimulating hormone from adhering to those receptor sites. Now, some professional technology that you have in your arsenal are lasers and light technology. Now, lasers, according to your training, they have different wavelengths and they penetrate different, different depths into the skin. Now, according to which laser you'll use, they're going to target certain chromophores within the skin. So as an example, that argon is going to target melanin and blood. And because it's a very short wavelength, it's going to target very superficial vascular issues and superficial pigmentation. And then you have the deeper um, wavelengths that may target water that are more resurfacing for the skin, but may not do anything in terms of pigmentation. So knowing the wavelengths and what the target chromophore will help you choose which which laser will be best to be used with pigmentation. The one consideration with laser is that it is causing heat in the skin, and that's why a lot of lasers won't be indicated for melasma because, again, that heat can cause that melan melanocyte into a state of distress and cause rebound pigmentation. IPL is a little different. It has a broad spectrum of light. So the lasers is one wavelength of light and it's very coherent. So they all move in the same direction and it's a very targeted treatment. Whereas IPL, you can think of it almost like a flashlight. When you're very close to the wall, it's a very targeted light. But when, as you move away, it definitely spreads out. So it's not um, as uh, diverse, it's not non-divergent is divergence where it will spread out. So it's not as an intensive treatment and it has a broader spectrum of light within it. I brought up a few studies because all these studies really will go towards showing that treating pigmentation with laser certainly has its risk. Um, post, from the fractionated laser skin resurfing treatment complications, this particular study had taken a lot of different studies and um, 
really combined all the results, and they found that 33% of pigmentation disorders treated with uh, lasers came back with further pigmentation as, as a complication. So choosing the laser is all about choosing the right Fitzpatrick type and the correct type of, of pigmentation. Melasma certainly is a little bit more tricky. Now with all of this, you can have the best laid plans, you can have the perfect laser, you can have the perfect skincare, and you are ready and set to go out and treat pigmentation. But what it really, really comes down to is the client's responsibility. And as a practitioner, we certainly have the right to stand in front of them and say, I'm going to give you the perfect regimen and we're going to do the perfect protocol. But if you don't take care of a few things at home, there's definitely going to be no improvement in your pigmentation. And the first and foremost is sun avoidance. It's not, oh, I'm going to the beach, let me put sunscreen on and let me sit under the hat and then I'll sit under the umbrella. No, if pigmentation is your issue, you cannot go into to the sun, it's as simple as that. Any UV, it bounces off the water, it bounces off the walls, any UV exposure will set your treatment protocol back. Internally, recommendations such as taking an omega-3 uh, supplementation will go a long way to ensuring that the cells are healthy. The cells will respond better to your treatment if they are healthy. So omega-3s to help lengthen the dendrites and help cell-to-cell -cell communication. Then making sure that through that client's consult, you take in a, a, a good list of all their medications that they're taking, because a lot of medications are gonna be sun sensitizing. Um, antidepressants and John's wort, these small little things, even as silly as a fragrance plugged into the wall, that fragrance lands on your skin, you expose yourself to sun and it causes damage. So even down to uh, those simplest things, the client has to be responsible for. And then the ingredients, ingredients within the skincare, we've discussed hydroquinone, we've discussed vitamin A, all of these, we need a broad spectrum plan to treat pigmentation, not one ingredient can do it on its own. And finally, when a client sits in front of you, after the age of 35, we lose 10 to 20% of our functioning melanocytes. So that means the balance of the melanocytes that are left behind are under a lot of duress to make up for those melanocytes that are no longer functioning. So then they, being under so much pressure, may get cellular damage. So after the age of 35, it becomes increasingly difficult to treat pigmentation, and this should always be discussed with the clients. So the process and progress is very long and very slow, and especially if they don't take time and, t and um, are diligent about staying out of the sun. And that sun exposure will set you back. And this client should really, should only expect to see results if you're only doing home care with professional treatments in about six months. And this is only if they diligently removing all offending causes and contributors to, to the pigmentation, that UV exposure, in, improving their diet, uh, making sure that they're not taking any medications that are internally um, stimulating pigmentation. Got to use that SPF with titanium or zinc oxide daily. You have to adjust that diet to include lots of antioxidants, both orally and uh, topically. The use of the correct home care is absolutely essential with preferable weekly facial treatments combined with laser treatments if, if um, appropriate. And those light therapies, when you're taking the risk factors into consideration, will certainly help a lot. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Does anybody have one or two questions for Candace before we move forward? Go ahead and step to the mic, please. Okay, so two. The first one, um, and sorry if this is obvious to everyone, but the Sepi White, what products is that contained in, or where, where can I find that? I could, I could definitely tell you where in my products you'd find them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, my best, my best advice would be is to uh, just Google that ingredient and it's very easy to see a list of, of products that are gonna be associated that use that. Alternatively, the, the manufacturer of that product is called Sepic, S-E-P-P-I-C, and they themselves are going to tell you where that, that ingredient is available along with all those white papers to prove its efficacy. Okay, great, thank you. My second question would be, when you were talking about the vitamin B3, the niacinamide being something that's also good for anti-inflammation, is there 
just an initial flush that is typical when using that type of product that then kind of adjusts and has that anti-inflammatory effect? Right. So when it comes to vitamin B3, and a lot of this comes down to cosmetic chemistry, which form? Because there's niacinamide or niacin, so there's vitamin B3, like vitamin C, that's available in its oil-soluble format or its acid format, and the particular form of vitamin B3 that you need that's very anti-inflammatory, it doesn't flush the skin, is niacinamide. So that's, that's a particular form that you should look for when you flip that cosmetic product over and you look at the list. And then not to get overly hyper, you know, focused on it, but so niacinamide, can it be then um, more or less, you know, pure based on the company making that particular? So I can't necessarily just feel like, oh, well, this says niacinamide, I'm good. Is it That's possible? such a great, sta it's a great question, and it leads to any ingredient that you're gonna be working with. Any cosmetic company should be able to supply you with proof of the ingredients that they're working with and how they work, just simply because everybody has access to vitamin C, and I keep on going back to it because it's the best example, but not everybody will work with a scorbyl tetraise, a palmitate. So speak to your vendor and speak to them specifically supplying you the information that you would need to say that this is the best form of this particular ingredient that you're working with. Excellent, thank you. Um, yes, my question relates to hydroquinone. Um, I know quite a few of the companies use hydroquinone as their main ingredient. And we have been told that, oh no, you can use it forever um, and so, what would you do after three months um, if you were going to have hydroquinone as a part of your regimen? Um, Absolutely. What so, what would plan? you do in the in the other? What would I do other times when yes. I'm not using the hydroquinone? And that is. Um, that's where the other ingredients come in. And I think that's why this presentation was so wonderful for me to put together because it shows you not only do you, can you use hydroquinone, but these are the other ingredients that you can use not only with hydroquinone, but when you stop using the hydroquinone as well. And that's why I particularly paid attention to showing you all the tyrosinase inhibitors. So maybe while they're on hydroquinone, drop out the vitamin C or the lactic acid or the kojic acid or the azelaic acid, and then as um, once they come off the hydroquinone, that's when you introduce those as tyrosinase inhibitors. So you're continuing that action, but you're just using a different ingredient. Oh, absolutely. You can stay on it for three months, then stop it, use the other tyrosinase inhibitors, and then come back onto it again. It's just you wouldn't use it for an extended period, continuously month after month after month. That's where the damage comes in. One more question, please. Hi there. Um, it's actually two part. One is I wanted your thoughts on, uh, in the literature recently, I've been seeing a lot of trend going f instead of retinol and exfoliating and breaking the skin down to building up the skin barrier. And then secondly, what line do you use? So th there is a huge trend in working with the skin physiology versus just exfoliating it. And you'll see it with a lot of skincare companies today. Because the healthier the skin is, the better it does its job, the more communications happening between the cells, the easier it is to reestablish the processes the way it's supposed to be. With melanogenesis, a lot of times what happens is the keratinocyte and the melanocyte aren't communicating anymore. So if you reestablish that communication by supplying them with the correct cytokines and the correct growth factors, you can see an improvement in not only pigmentation, but the skin as a whole. And the second thing is I work for Environ. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.